Things are never as simple as they seem. Let's get started. Another race for the world's greatest driver, Juan Manuel Fangio. Former world champion Jim Clark leapt into the lead. That's Clark's Lotus going like a bomb. But James Hunt is the world champion by just one single point. By being a racing driver, you are under risk all the time. And if you no longer go for a gap that exists, you're no longer a racing driver. And that is Michael Schumacher ahead, the world champion. To become a four-time world champion, Sebastian Vettel, Lewis Hamilton, champion of the world. That's for all the kids out there who dream the impossible. Max Verstappen, for the first time ever, is champion of the world. Yes! Hello and welcome to episode 33 of F1 in Review, the episode and the hour where we discuss the Japanese Grand Prix and look forward to the next Grand Prix, that being in the US of A. I'm Tom Claibon and I'm joined by Tristan Fancourt and Angus Gallagher. A reminder that you can follow myself and Tristan individually on Twitter, as well as the F1 in Review Twitter account, where we very sporadically post the episodes once they've gone out. That's my fault again. We launch now into the very first topic, confusion. Owing to yet more heavy rain and the rule that a Grand Prix race must be finished within three hours, we only got 40 minutes of racing in Japan, but for once this wasn't even remotely controversial. The controversy came when Sainz and Albon aquaplaned off the circuit, the race was red flagged, there was a tractor recovery vehicle brought onto the circuit to retrieve those two cars. But instead of getting all the cars in before getting said tractor on, the tractor was on the track as the cars were being picked up by the safety car. Now, every driver was understandably quite furious about this, especially Pierre Gasly, because for those who don't know, for those who d indeed do know about this, Jules Bianchi, a 25-year-old driver from France, died on this circuit in very similar conditions back in 2014 when his Marussia car slid off the track and went headfirst into one of these tractor recovery vehicles. It's worth saying that after the race, the FIA released a statement which read, in part, the FIA has launched a thorough investigation of the events involving the deployment of recovery vehicles during the Japanese Grand Prix. This is part of common practice of debriefs and analysis of all race incidents to ensure continual improvements of processes and procedures. So our thoughts then on, first of all, this absolute mess, which unfortunately overshadows what was a race where Max Verstappen became a two-time world champion. Oh, goodness gracious me. It seems like there's a common theme with uh, any time rain appears on the F1 track at the moment um, with new controversies appearing. And I think there was quite a lot to divulge uh, out of this race, uh, a race weekend, I think, in, in, in total. Um, firstly, good on the FIA and the stewards for getting going. Um, at at on um, on the morning of the Japanese Grand Prix, it was raining, and I thought they were going to red flag it, but they went, "All right, we think it's good enough. Let's go." Which was a bit different to what they did in Singapore when I thought they waited too long. I actually commend the uh, the race directors for getting going and starting the race in in wet conditions. It was obviously they felt that the track was safe enough to to get going and. I think that marks um, a little line in the sand, perhaps in the stewards' minds and the race directors' minds between a street track and a proper race track. Perhaps we are now getting closer to um, finding out when F1 is happy to get going in wet conditions. It looks like mostly they're happier when it's on race tracks rather than street tracks, which is excellent. But do bear in mind that we're getting more and more street tracks into the into the sport. So hey. Um, that's something to consider, I suppose, going forward. But as you say, Tom, the race didn't last very long. And on the first lap, Carlos Sainz just, you know, aquaplaned off, hit, into, hit the side into the barriers, a bit of signage fell off and smashed into, uh, I say smashed, it's a bit <laughs> a bit of, a, of hyperbole there, but, you know, stuck itself onto the front of Pierre Gasly's car. So for a brief moment, Pierre Gasly had what looked like a snowplow stuck to the front of his car <laughs> rather than uh, a pretty little uh, front wing. And though it, it took, I think, ages for the race director to throw out a safety car. And I think that's one of the things that struck me. It just 
watching the cars go flying past Carlos Sainz as he's on the left-hand side of the track. And I was thinking, look, if anyone anyone else aquaplanes, it's going to hit the side of him. And it took ages for that safety car to come out. More than 20 seconds, which is an age in Formula 1. So I wanted them to react quicker. As soon as he, he, he actually hit the hit the side, I was thinking, right, that's an immediate safety car. It should just be an immediate safety car. If we're going, going in the wet, we got to understand that basically any crash means a safety car. So it should have been instant. And I was disappointed it wasn't. And then the disappointment sort of kept coming because Gasly, who I just spoke about then, who had a little bit of a, a, a Rolex sign impaled on his front wing, went back into the pits and got a change of tyres to the full wet tyres, came back out and tried to catch up with the safety car because it had been thrown. Now, Pierre Gasly was going at a significant speed when he mm. came across the tractor that Tom you spoke about in the in the in the intro then and well was far too close to a tractor i'm going to read you the penalty that the stewards have given to pierre gasly because i think it's important that we understand the chain of events there um including the speeds that pierre gasly was going and and the fact it was a red flag so the fia have awarded Pierre Gasly um, some penalties for uh, breaching Article 57.2 of the FIA F1 Sporting Regulation. So he's going to get two penalty points um, and a, and also a drive through penalty imposed after the end of the race. Um, two penalty points. The reason the stewards heard from the driver of number 10, which is Pierre Gasly, and the representatives and reviewed the videos and the telemetry. After passing the scene of the incident, car number 10, Pierre Gasly, continued under the red flag situation at speeds which exceeded 200 kilometers an hour on multiple occasions and reached 251 kilometers an hour at one point. The driver conceded that he now understood that there could have been marshals or obstacles on the tracks and admitted that he was too fast. However, in mitigation of penalty, we take into account that although speeds could not um, by any measure be regarded as slow as required in the regulations it was slower than the maximum speed that could be achieved under these conditions i.e he could have gone faster if he'd liked we also take into account the shock of the driver experiencing a truck on the racing line in the corner of the incident so they acknowledge that there was a tractor well as we like to say on the track when pierre gasly came past now I, I do think he was traveling too quickly. A red flag had been shown and you are supposed mm-hmm. to be slowing down. And to me, 200 kilometers an hour, that's 120 miles an hour, you know, is, is rather fast. 250 kilometers an hour is about 150 odd miles an hour, give or take. Um, and, you know, that is a, that's fast for wet conditions and the visibility is pretty poor. But why are there tractors on the track when there are cars on the track, I said it before, I'll say it again. There should never, ever be trucks or tractors or sweepers or anything big and heavy or like machinery on the track when there are cars on the track because accidents happen. Look, I know, I know the, the stewards will say, well, if he was going slower, he could have avoided it or, you know, he would have had better visibility. The fact of the matter is prevention is better than the cure. You should always prevent accidents from happening rather than rely on all the other safety stuff. Because although the safety stuff is excellent, I'd rather Pierre Gasly wasn't put in that situation in the first place. So in future, it should be that a red flag gets called because a car like Carlos Sainz hits the barriers. All the cars, including the ones that like Pierre Gasly are going around the track, come into the set into the pits or, or wherever they want them to go and then and only then once no one is on the live track the trucks come out because i i think it, we're going to have another death soon and when we do we're all going to be sitting here with you know our surprise pikachu faces on going well how did this happen or you know well how can we prevent this in the future and that's too late we've got to do it now yeah the tractor thing is a joke it's an absolute joke how that was allowed to happen. Um, it's it's multifaceted this whole point because I agree with what you say, Tristan, and that actually we have to give a small ounce of credit to the FIA for actually racing because we've had scenarios in the last year, in the last few weeks, such as Singapore, where 
racing hasn't even taken part uh, or occurred and they've instead just gone erred on the side of caution so it's actually to be fair got to give them a bit of credit for allowing them to allowing the drivers to race in the situation that they did and allowing it to go ahead um but also like you say a a gross show of incompetence really by having a tractor on the track when there were still cars circling round and it's at the exact same track where that fatal crash happened 8 years ago i mean it's it's unfortunately written that it was the same track um and yeah it's just yeah it's ridiculous really that that was allowed to happen because like you said one small mistake by Pierre Gasly in that car and then that could have ended up in much more horrific tragic circumstances um yeah i i just don't what it must be like someone's had a brain fade in the stewards room or one of the marshals has just not thought and they've wanted to clear a car um my best guess would be without i'm not trying to justify it here but my best guess would be that they have seen that there is a red flag situation and they've presumed that all the cars are back in the pits and therefore that they have sent someone out there to on the tractor but again yeah it still doesn't excuse it and the one the one thing from the instant eight years ago that killed Jules Bianchi was that the reason why the instant argue could have happened was because there wasn't something like a virtual safety car in place and there wasn't red flag. It was only double waved yellows, hence the greater blurred lines in terms of how fast the driver could go. But this was black and white. It was a red fl- black and white. It was a red flag, but it was black and white. <laughs> it was clear that it was a race neutralized situation. So, so why would the tractor? I can see, well, in fact, I can see why the tractor would be sent out there, but it doesn't justify it. Like it doesn't justify it. It's disgraceful that that ended up being a presence on the track. And yeah, we're lucky that it didn't end up being much worse. Um, and yeah, it kind of proceeded. That proceeded a race where the confusion was rife, and we get on. To, I mean, past the tractor instead, we get on to the fact that I don't think a world champion has ever been crowned in the middle of an interview in Park Fermé. Um, (laughs) Because that is literally what happened because Max Verstappen was standing there having his interview with Johnny Herbert and then just behind him on the screen a sign flashed up saying Max Verstappen 2022 Formula 1 world champion. And because everyone, including Red Bull, thought that the rules were if a race doesn't reach three quarters distance then half points are awarded. So for that to happen in this race, there would have had to have been 40 laps out of the 53 completed, but only 28 were completed. So it was to everyone's confusion why the full points were awarded. And the reason being that after the famous, infamous, infamous 2021 Belgian Grand Prix, they rejigged the rules so that uh, points could be awarded in full uh, in a race like this. But they didn't quite specify about when they could be awarded in full. The reason they were awarded in full was because they couldn't be awarded in full if the race could not be resumed. The difference being, despite the two-hour delay after the two-lap uh, attempt at the start, the race was resumed for those remaining 40 minutes of racing, hence why the full points were being awarded. But again, I can't lie to you, not the best look if your rules don't stand up and the application of your rules only happens after the race when people didn't even know the rule was going to be applied. So, again, not the best look for the FIA. It's kind of been a weekend of... This world is a lot about optics and what you see on the outside rather than what actually goes on behind the scenes. And in said world, the FIA have had a stinking weekend for good reasons, in terms of... As in for justified reasons, because of the tractor incident and the organisation that led to that occurring is very poor, very shoddy. Um, but also the fact that they just couldn't even, uh, there was confusion about their own rule. The fact that it may well have been clear behind closed doors, but it didn't seem it's the general public. So the FIA, once again, having questions to answer, um, in what was a, yeah, bizarre weekend where we'll get, I'm sure we'll get onto, we will get onto later about the crowning of twice world champion Max Verstappen as he is now but yeah in terms of the FIA and the confusion it's just confusing it's just even things like as far as I knew and we think we talked about this on our group chat as far as I knew a race could last up to two hours of racing or up to four hours including a red flag period 
but then it's three hours. I don't remember that rule coming in. So once again, just confusion reigning realistically from those that are in charge not being able to um, diffuse the correct information properly to team principals, to drivers, to and to us as fans, really. Mm. Yeah, we've spoken the last few episodes about the FIA and they need to learn from their mistakes. And it's one thing to talk about learning from your mistakes in regards to we need to make sure that we get more racing, better racing, fairer racing, more competitive racing, etc. But it's another thing to say, learn from your mistakes when it comes to a fatal collision in 2014. And I feel that the FIA's credibility, their reputation has taken a real damage has taken serious damage this weekend and has really taken damage over the last three weekends, race weekends I should say, in regards to a variety of things. But the fact that, you know, to read again, the same circuit, the same conditions, and we have a similar incident once again, only eight years on from when that happened, that's got to be the very basic thing the FAA does. And don't get me wrong, the FAA are not flippant when it comes to safety. The introduction of the halo and a range of other mechanisms show they take safety very seriously. But the fact we've had a near car copy of what happens to Jules Bianchi with someone like Pierre Gasly is frankly inexcusable. I think it's insulting to his memory. I think in extremists, I think the heads could perhaps roll for this or should roll because you just cannot have a scenario where you have a slow, large object, a tractor, recovery vehicle on the racing line. It's one thing to have it just inside the circuit, very much tucked away, one could argue. But to have it literally on the track when there's cars racing round or going fast around that circuit is really ridiculous. And to make a, another point as well, you know, the confusion we talked about with points, it's, it's a litter really of some real interesting, you could say, really confusing, really bizarre frankly wrong decisions being made by the FAA. I mean, going back to Monza, for example, we had the safety car controversy. Singapore, we had the controversy as well with restarting. Japan, we've got more controversy as well. This time it's a, a dual-pronged controversy when it comes to the tracks, when it comes to the points. It's one thing to go and learn from your mistakes when it comes to the minor things, but not something as serious as this. And I think the FA really had to go and up their game because once again we're coming towards the end of a Formula 1 season and the focus is very much on those who make the decisions rather those than you know, go forward with the racing and go and bring forward the entertainment and the sporting competition, really. And if this carries on this trend of, I suppose, you could say, a worse negligence, best incompetence, then the sport takes real damage. People in extremists switch off from the sport. People don't take the uh, authority of the FIA as seriously as before. And that does serious damage in terms of future decisions where the FIA have to intervene and have to go and decide it one way or the other, really. So hugely disappointed when it comes to that. You know, congratulations to Max Verstappen. But the focus, once again, is on ultimately the FIA screwing it up. Credit to them, as we say, for actually getting racing. But I think, realistically speaking, the fact that we had a red flag one lap in, we were short on time. Time, as is the rules, is the reason we saw a tractor or recovery vehicle go into the circuit. The FIA almost panicked and went, oh, blimey, we've got to go and get some race again after last week's blunder. Um, get the tractor on as soon as you can, get that car off, and let's go racing again. I mean, it's just really not, it's, well, not on, it's not excusable, excusable, really, when it comes to the very top of Formula One. Now, and to, to answer Angus's question a moment ago, the... FIA reduced the ma maximum F1 time to three hours for the 2021 uh, season. So it's only it's only a recent change, hence why if you go back to like 2017, for example, Azerbaijan Grand Prix would have lasted longer than, than allowed. Um, and Bahrain, uh, if you remember when the, uh, the infamous Bahrain um, race, um, which in 2020, in which uh, Roman Grosjean had his, his accident, his crash, um, that was pretty. That would have been pretty close. I'd been at two hours fifty nine minutes, <laughs> but I so say that would have been thirteen seconds short of actually not having a full race there. And I think, to be honest, one of the issues we're finding is is having to fit a race in three hours is not necessarily a particularly brilliant system. Simply because for a, a fast track, like uh, for example, like um at the new Saudi Arabia Grand Prix. Right, that's probably okay. But Singapore, that makes no sense at all because it, you can't have any sort of stoppages then. And to have, let's say, you know, a, a pretty average race is coming close to two hours. Having the the full race time have to fit within three hours means you're only giving yourself a 
um, sort of leeway. And so four hours to me makes a lot more sense. And I know there was a discussion about this and the, the counter is, well, it was getting very dark at Japan by the end of the race. Well, we don't necessarily think that Japan should be in October uh, because it would make much more sense to have it at the beginning of the season. But the race organisers, for some reason, don't don't want to move at them. So, you know, we, we are a an adaptive agile sport and have managed on four hours for a rather long time i think since 2011 so anyone who's like oh well we can't have it four hours that's far too long look we did it for nine years i think we can do it for a little bit longer and this three hour window again adds arbitrary time pressures this is what bugs me tom you're absolutely right you're like oh well we have to do it within uh, um three hours quick get the tractors on quick get the safety car out quick <laughs> red flag the race or, or don't red flag the race because then we can't you know restart it in time you know having these arbitrary pressures means you lack you know adequate time to make decisions such as right you know let's red flag the race and prevent anyone from crashing into a tractor great idea it, it, it would and then also when you come to restart the race as well you'd want to get it started quicker which may compromise safety. And, you know, if we did, let's say, have that extra hour at, in, at the Japanese Grand Prix, then, you know, we could have had a longer race out of it. And yes, it might have been dark, but there were, you know, flood lamps. And, and if it was light enough to race, we would have had more laps, which means we would have, you know, maybe an even more exciting race. Um, in terms of the points, though, as well, this one was a little bit tricky because uh, to, to, in their defence... They did keep trying to tell us that 25 points was going to be awarded to Max Verstappen. It kept flashing up um, on the screen that Max Verstappen would get 25 points. And all the commentators mm. were like, oh, I don't know why it's flashing up 25 points on the screen. Because I have right in front of me Article 6.5 of the FII sport, uh, FIA Sporting Regulations. Croft, David Croft said that. And I was thinking, mm. yeah, you do. And you didn't read them. Because if you look at the very, very top of that point, when he kept going on about how he's got the three columns in front of him, if he had actually just read the very top bit, it does say if a race is suspended in accordance and cannot be resumed. The thing is, then this is what makes it difficult. This is actually poor language, I think, from uh, the, the FIA. The, the key bit there, if you just read it, is and cannot be resumed. That, that has created a, a negative consequence. You know, if you start a race and it cannot be cons you know, um, resumed, that's the negative consequence. You get those three things. The implication of that rule, and this is where it becomes a little bit more tricky because you have to you know, infer the implication, is if it can be resumed, you that the following doesn't apply. And so that that's poor accessibility, obviously, from the FIA and the sporting regulations. So... They did actually try to tell everyone for a while that it was going to be 25 points. And um, I think none of us believed it, me included, because I was looking at it thinking, yeah, why on earth are they flashing up 25 points? That's not going to happen. It's going to be, you know, much less than that. Max Verstappen's not going to win. But anyway, turns out um, they were trying to tell us all along and we all just ignored it. So I think uh, what they'll probably do is re review it over the winter period and add in uh, another thing that. Maybe they'll re they'll remove the and cannot be uh, resumed thing and just say if you know if uh, if a race does not um, go over you know seventy five percent this is the amount of points you get if it doesn't go over fifty percent this is the amount of points you get like if it, let's make it slightly simpler more accessible to us because look I'm no I'm no lawyer I'm not an expert in reading long complex you know regulations and having to interpret them to understand their meaning you know, we, we, none of us you know particularly want to sit there and try and infer every meaning out of it let's have simple plain language that isn't open to interpretation because as you say tom it's all you know it's all about optics um and having that level of interpretation means often we're, we're all left wondering quite how we got into the situation and as you and as you said angus we should never have like the the end of the championship um sort of drivers championship occur in the middle of an interview with the world champion asking am i world champion you know is it is it me oh 
Oh, am I supposed to be sitting in this big chair? Of course, it's lonely. And we didn't get the Max Verstappen, you are the double world champion from Christian Horner, which is really annoying because it means I can't change our intro. Because <laughs> <laughs> the only clip we got of Max Verstappen was him saying the words, I'm lonely. <laughs> Doesn't work as well. <laughs> But regardless about how it came about, it was a question of when it would happen, not if it would happen, when Max Verstappen would become a double world champion. He's had a barnstorming season, he's dominated, and let's be honest, he's faced relatively little opposition or competition this year, aside from a handful of races. And the main competitor he has, really, is his teammate Sergio Perez, after ultimately the Ferraris didn't do so well after a number of races at the start. So it means that he goes level with Fernando Alonso, Mika Hakkinen, Jim Clark, Graham Hill, Emerson Fittipaldi and Alberto Ascari in terms of being double world champions. Our thoughts on the Dutchman season and the racing driver he is and may become in the future. Yeah, Max Verstappen, double world champion. Um, same before we came on, it's flown by, hasn't it? A year ago, he was still battling tooth and nail with Hamilton for that first title. And then a year on, he's wrapped it up with four races to go. Um, major Sebastian Vettel vibes and and that the first championship came after a tooth and nail battle and was really tough and the second championship once Verstappen had that confidence he just absolutely has flown the title Um, and also I was reading an article very similar and we're going to have some some people groan and moan at this this comparison but Michael Schumacher won his first two titles in a very similar way he was a tooth and nail battle against Damon Hill to get the first and then cruise to the second again with like two, three races left um, in a superior car and with a driver on top of his game. Um, I'm going to put this out there. I'm going to hopefully get this replayed. It's to be honest, it's not the most rogue shout in the world, but I think Max Verstappen will break the world the record for championships in the future. I can see him definitely going past Lewis Hamilton seven um, for several reasons. One, he's still very young, but he's not at his peak. I'd say. He's still only 25, which is crazy considering he's been in the sport eight years now. Um, his statistics and his his ability to rack up consistency is ph- phenomenal as far as I'm concerned. Um, it shows you how fast time flies in life that he now has the same number of world championships and the same number of wins as Fernando Alonso. 32 wins and two world championships as of this moment. Um, and he just... He's just an absolute beast. To, for want of a better word, he's just an absolute beast. Um, I see a generation of drivers we have in Formula 1 at the moment with lots of talent. You've got your Verstappen, you've got your Leclerc, Russell, your Sainz, your Norris, and then your more low-key ones like your Ocon, your Gasly. Not to give, not to forget the veterans like Lewis Hamilton or Fernando Alonso. Um, but I see a man in Max Verstappen at the very top of his game and also someone who now has that experience in those situations. So if ever he was to be, for example, in a championship fight against Lando Norris, Verstappen has that wherewithal, that experience to know what it is like. He knows what it's like now to win a championship in a hard-fought battle. And he also knows what what it's like to win a championship in relative cruise control. I know they'll say it isn't cruise control, and it's not really in the end, but all things considered, he's won this championship with four races to go. So he's won it pretty comfortably. And I think that experience will serve him really well. And I think, to be honest, the fact of how good he's been this year is very ominous for the rest of the field. Um, The only two mistakes I can recall, three actually, I can recall him making. Those spins in Spain and Hungary, oh wait, he won the races anyway. Um, So in reality, Singapore is his only real poor race. The two races he didn't finish, mechanical. Silverstone, would have won the race, but it wasn't. He had a mechanical issue. Came seventh. So other than that, he finished on the podium in every single race. Um, won twelve times out of eighteen. Singapore was his one stinker. He's had a car which isn't wasn't even the fastest over one lap. The Ferrari this season has got ten pole positions compared to Red Bull, who've only got seven pole positions. So. He's not even in the fastest car over one lap, and he's absolutely smoked the whole field. So, um, yeah, the man's a machine, really. And it's almost like Jos Verstappen, when he was younger, 
Uh, he saw his son Max growing up and he thought, right, can I create a lab version of me, the perfect Formula 1 driver in the future, a perfect specimen? And through a combination of tough parenting, relentless karting, a drive for success and a love for racing, uh, Jos Verstappen has created a son who's an absolute monster um, and a, ph- a phenomenon, really. So, yeah, I think Verstappen... Verstappen will now go into seasons. This is the thing with this championship winning pedigree. He will go next season, no matter if Red Bull is the fastest car, he will go in as the man to beat, as the man to fear. And that in in itself is enough to put other drivers on the back foot. It's what Lewis Hamilton did for years. Simply through the through the the presence of the man and the the thought knowing that you're up against him was enough to play mind games with even some of the best, like Vettel or Bottas or Rosberg. So for me, Verstappen is growing into an ever-increasing unstoppable force. Um, obviously, F1 beating records are a long way off for him, but he's racking up those numbers pretty quickly, and he's looking more and more impregnable as the days goes on. But yeah, double world champion, congratulations to him, of course. And yeah, his rivals better watch out, I'd say. Tom, was it surprising to you that Max Verstappen was world champion this year? <laughs> um, at the start of the season, when we look at the first few races, I think it kind of was because there was a really close battle between himself and Leclerc. Ferrari did look bulletproof in those first five races, I think it's fair to say. And as Angus said there, they have the quickest car. They were the quickest car. So I thought that... Verstappen had a very good chance of winning this world championship, but it was no dead beat cert that he would do so, really. Um, but congratulations to him, he's not really put a foot wrong. Aside from Singapore, just say that he's been pretty much untouchable. The question now is what happens to him in terms of the 23 season, because looking at those who have also won two world championships, they won one after the other. So Alonso, for example, 2005, 2006, Mick Hakkinen, 98, 99, and that's where it stopped. So he could either go down path A of being a double world champion, let's say Red Bull don't do too well next season, owing to, I don't know, a punishment for a cost cap violation, let's say, um, just being hypothetical, of course. <laughs> or he could do, go down a sort of um, Sebastian Vettel route or a Lewis Hamilton route where he builds on and it becomes four on the spin, or someone like Hamilton, it becomes five on the spin or even six. So I don't think it's a, a cert that he will go on and get three, four, five seven, eight, ten world championships uh, to his name. But there's no doubt that he is the man to beat moving forwards because he's shown a mental resilience, I think, above Leclerc. You could tell that he'd been in a battle before versus Leclerc being new to it. And ultimately, his uh, driving quality, his craftsmanship was incredible, really. Coupled with a decent car, it was a, a great alignment, really, of the three main things you need to go and win a championship. And the fact he's done it so early should strike fear into the heart of those who are going to go up against him because it's what Lewis Hamilton did, it's what um, Schumacher did, it's what Vettel did as well. So expectations are high, but it remains to be seen whether he can fulfil that. Well, that's, a, that's an excellent summary um, from both of you, actually. And it's it's good to hear that breakdown of, of the statistics from, from you, Angus. And Tom, I can't help thinking that, that, that everything you said there was just a very you know long wind to say i'm not sure whether or not he'll win another one but he could <laughs> and um pretty much <laughs> <laughs> which i love i think that's brilliant mm-hmm. um i completely agree that max Verstappen may or may not win another one um going forward <laughs> um either back to back or uh with a hiatus but certainly max has been uh, darn good this year I, I don't know unstoppable maybe is a is a good term um, and I don't think anyone could necessarily catch him. And part of that reason, I think, is because when you look at Red Bull, when you look at Ferrari, they seem to be diametrically opposed to one another. You've got Ferrari, who has, in my opinion, the fastest car. You've got an amazing driver. You've got, you know, Marinello's got its its um, personalised racetrack just for Ferrari. They've got the history. They've got the money. They've even got their automotive section of the of the team propping it up, making sure they can produce this incredible car. And then on the other hand, you've got Red Bull, which kind of is, you know, doesn't have any of that. I mean, it has, you know, a bit of money, you know, a good amount of money behind it, but it doesn't have the cars, you know. It's got a, a, a completely different, I think, style of driver in Max Verstappen. 
you know, it's got, it's based, you know, just in the UK. It's not got the significant history behind it, but Red Bull is so much more it's, than the sum of its parts, whereas Ferrari is so much less than the sum of its parts. And it's bizarre to me that Ferrari, you know, have all this stuff behind it and doesn't do as well as teams that have significantly less. So I think Red Bull this year has just clicked. You know, they might not be the best at everything. But somehow, when you average everything out, the pit stops, the strategy, the drivers, you get something just a little bit magic. It's something that we saw in Mercedes, and perhaps Mercedes did it even better than than Red Bull did this year, um, if you look at their maximum dominance. But it's certainly clear that Red Bull picked up the pieces after the first rocky start in the middle of the season. Let's not forget that Max Verstappen and Perez had their fair share of DNFs and have just kind of rolled with the, the, the wave of success. And I can't help but thinking we need to do a little shout out for Sergio Perez, who twice now has been completely key to Max Verstappen winning his world championship points for a, a given race. Abu Dhabi last year, Perez was definitely significant by slowing down Lewis Hamilton. Do you remember when that incredible piece of defending um, occurred, mm. allowing Verstappen to catch back up and arguably putting him in a better place to go ahead and, and win the that Grand Prix? Let's quickly move on from that. And then this, <laughs> this year putting massive pressures on Charles Leclerc during the Japanese sprint race, I mean Grand Prix, um, in which forced Charles Leclerc to make a mistake, cut the chicane on the last corner, get a five-second time penalty, giving Perez second place and securing Max Verstappen in the end the win because he had enough points over Charles Leclerc. Worth pointing out, by the way, and we did. I'm I'm sorry we didn't touch on this in the previous um, conversation about the the cock ups, but uh, they also threw the flag too early, like a lap early at the end of the Japanese Grand oh, yeah. Prix as well, um, because I think the reason was because the time ticked down just after Max Verstappen crossed the line, so Max Verstappen had to do another lap and then another lap because you have to complete the lap you're on and when the time ticks down and then you do a final lap. I think someone got confused because of the whenever Max Verstappen crossed the line and time down to zero. So technically speaking, it didn't give um, Charles Leclerc enough time to give the place back. Um, so there should have been another lap. So, you know, you, you might be able to add that to the list of things that went wrong this weekend. Um, and as a result, they gave uh, Charles Leclerc a five second penalty and a penalty point just for good measure. But Max Verstappen, you know, when you think about all the controversies this uh, surrounding this season, when you think about just how immense the season has been from a talent perspective, you know, every single, you know, it feels like every single race we're we're sitting here reflecting on Verstappen's progress, and I can't but help but think, but when we said, oh, that you know, the pendulum is swinging towards Max, and we think it swung towards Max. And, and and no point since we said that sort of 10, 15 podcasts ago. Do I, have I thought, oh, maybe Ferrari's gathering pace again. They just completely dropped the ball uh, to the point where, you know, Charles Leclerc is now behind Sergio Perez in the points. So it, it's, it's amazing to me uh, that we are already saying Max Verstappen two-time world champion because... The max we have now is so different to the max we had in 2019, 2018, 2017, when we had this young, inexperienced driver who gets so angry and frustrated and lose silly points because he he was unable to control the passion. And now we have a max that I feel has has mellowed a bit and is now in really into his stride, gathering a 30 second lead in a in. <laughs> 30 laps or under 30 laps against the second place individual is an amazing talent and to be honest I would be worried if I was every other team about Max and Red Bull going into next year because once you've got the wind in your sails 
my goodness, you can capitalize on that advantage. And I think Red Bull, now that they're paired back with Honda, yay, um, has <laughs> certainly got their wind in their sails and are, are going at top knots towards more victories i i could easily see given that how they've done in so far in this rule spec and how long this rule spec is going to go on for i could easily see max winning next year's and Mm. maybe the year after and on that point then cards on the table how many world championships will he win i'll start off four i've said it already he'll beat the record i'm gonna say eight uh i'm gonna say i'm gonna say five hmm only time will tell. Well, he's got two at the moment. <laughs> and it's twenty twenty two, and but there, remember, there are significant engine changes coming in. Um, there are in just a, in are. a in a few years' time. So, given that we've got mm. these these new changes in in twenty twenty six, and that could throw in some some problems. We know how powerful the engines are. Then, let's say he wins twenty twenty three, twenty four, twenty five. And then it changes in 2026. I'm adding three onto that. So I think he's going to win the next three years. So moving on now, the FIA released the findings of their cost cap investigation on Monday. For us, that's yesterday. We're recording on Tuesday. And they found out that, drumroll please, Red Bull have committed a procedural breach and a minor financial overspend of less than 5% of the cost cap budget. The cost cap is 145 million US dollars, meaning the overspend could be up to 7 million dollars. Red Bull said in a statement they were surprised but disappointed by the findings from the FIA. Meanwhile, Aston Martin have been found guilty of a procedural breach. What do we make then of the news coming out from the FIA that two teams have violated the cost cap uh, limits and the punishments as uh, we record now are yet to be known but coming in due course we're told. So Tom, I want I, I want to pose this question at you because you have yet to speak first on these matters and, and equality okay. is, is, is what we uphold in F1 in review. Does it matter if you overspend by 1%, 5%, 10%, you know, does any breach warrant the same level of penalty? No, I think that the punishment and Red Bull should be punished for their overspend has to be proportionate. If the overspend was found to be in the excess of sort of double millions when it comes to US dollars, not a minor financial breach, then we'd be talking about serious sanctions when it comes to taking away world championships, for example, be it drivers, be it constructors as well. In extremists, we could be talking about Red Bull being suspended from the sports, be it for a year or two or indefinitely. But the fact that it is a minor breach, there's there's rumours swirling around about how much it should be. I think that they shouldn't be you know, suspended or really deeply punished when it comes to taking well-earned trophies away from the team. But they should be punished moving forwards when it comes to either a hefty fine for the season uh, or a hefty fine moving forwards as well. Or something where we see other teams gain back the advantage that Red Bull have gained this season and perhaps in the season past as well. But the underlying message for me is that Red Bull have to be punished because otherwise if they're not punished, you set a dangerous precedent where teams go, well, if Red Bull overspent and were only slapped on the wrist or reprimanded very slightly, then we'll do it and then we'll do it. And then ultimately the cost cap becomes irrelevant. It becomes a figurehead, but something that's not really adhered to there. So... It's a bit of a watershed moment for the FA in terms of what they do, in terms of whether they stamp their foot down and really show authority and show decision, or whether they don't really. I hope they learn from their mistakes. I keep on saying this, but I hope they learn from their mistakes and ultimately do punish Red Bull for this. But in answer to your question, I think the punishment has to fit the scale or nature of the crime. So it shouldn't just be a blanket, um, and should I say, you know, sort of oversized or needless or um, one-size-fits-all punishment for an overspend, be it a one US dollar or seven million US dollars. Well, I, I, I'd i kind of agree with you, Tom. I think that, yeah, you have to have proportional. But um, the point is, is, I think there is no such thing as a little overspend, even if it's one, you know, one dollar. I, I think they should be, you know, have a, a pretty harsh punishment because... You've got to make an example out of this because otherwise it starts making financial sense. You know, if let's say it was only a fine, then it starts making financial Mm. sense to overspend because the fine is going to be less. So, you know, oh no, we've overspent and accidentally overdeveloped our wing. Ugh, (laughs) Castillo us. 
Um, that sort of thing. Um, so how do you prevent it? I mean, to be honest, we, we don't know the ins and outs of this case yet. And it's worth saying that because, as, as you yep. say, Tom, we don't know. There are many rumours. So the current rumours are that Red Bull did not include certain costs, which the FIA believe should be included. And currently the rumour is that they didn't include their catering costs. Um, and that they've overspent by about one point eight million um, pounds, which I don't know if you uh, if you want to if you want to think about that in terms of um, you know it, how much consequential that will be because um, you know, it's, uh, that's two million dollars I think at the moment about two million dollars out of one hundred and forty five mm. million is the cost cap at the moment. So like wow, that's a pretty insignificant spend. But let's let's be clear that to some extent there is no such thing as a, as a small overspend because two million pounds worth of R&D development can be worth tenths of a second. You know, a couple of tenths of a second. Mm. And a couple of tenths of a second is enough to be in pole position because ten laps of two tenths of a second makes you two seconds up on the person behind, which means you're out of DRS range. <gasps> Suddenly it makes a big difference, doesn't it? And so I think the FIA need to make sure that they're clamping down on this. And so as I say, they think that... Um, Red Bull didn't include the like the catering at the moment and if they spent two million dollars on catering what the hell are they feeding everyone I don't know that's <laughs> wow that's some impressive things I, I half expect the um the the pedal to be penalty to be that the Red Bull has to provide lunch to the entire paddock for the next season um <laughs> that'd be you know, according to them that'd be 20 million 20 million uh, dollar fine um on lunch uh <laughs> I saw someone saying uh, Max is going to be renamed Steak Verstappen, which uh, made me um, <laughs> chuckle a little bit. But anyway, um, that's what I guess we'll find out um, in the in the coming days what they've overspent exactly and, and how they've done it. Now, in terms of a penalty, um, I, I think it should be directly... Um, they should be directly accountable, uh, as in the team principals should be directly accountable. I heard Mon- Martin Brundle say that first for full disclosure, and I agree with it. I think that um, they, you know, there should be some sort of maybe more personal fine levied against the team principals because at the end of the day, they are the the principals of the team. They're the the buck stops with them. They signed off on this, so maybe they should have some sort of fine levied against them, make it a little bit more serious. Uh, secondly, mm. I think you should get a reduction in wind tunnel time, and I think you should have a reduction in your final payout um, from the the winnings in the constructors. Maybe you say, if you know, we will we will fine you. I don't know, six times, five times, whatever you overspent, or or ten million dollars. Which one is ever the highest? Um, as as sort of a minimum so in red bull's case they'd be fine 10 million dollars which is you know significant amount of money you overspent by five by two you get fined five times um and when you pair that with a reduction maybe in the um and i'm saying is that should come out also from the r&d budget from the next year you should have a a reduction in in your r&d budget for the next year i think of whatever you spent overspent in the year before if that makes sense so if you had my, mm-hmm. I think, pretty harsh rules in place, you would have a fine against Christian Horner. You would have a reduction in your wind tunnel time. You would be fined. Red Bull would be fined $10 million for overspending. And they would have $2 million taken away from their cost cap going forward. I know it sounds really harsh, but we have to have a system where Haas can compete with Ferrari, right? Mm. Williams can compete with Mercedes. McLaren compete with themselves, I guess, um, and and Aston Martin. (laughs) And these are teams that have so many differences that you have to have an even playing field. And so if you go over, you should be punished very, very harshly. I don't think they should take away the um, championship from Max in last year, and I don't think they should levy anything against Max. It's not his fault. But there should be pretty harsh fines towards the team. So until we find out exactly what has happened, I think I'll hold a reserve judgment. But if they have gone over, oh, I'll come down hard on them. Yeah, I agree. you got to back up what you say about the cost cap. And I've got 
something here which when it was introduced in 2019 because budgeting and cost caps is something which have been tried to be introduced for years and it's something which has not been successful it's something which has met, priced some teams out of formula one the reason why arguably uh the ill-fated lotus hispania and virgin teams or hrt caterham and marussia as they would become known as the reason why they all were priced out of F1 within five, six years or five, six, seven years was due to the fact partly that the cost cap was just out of their realms of possibility. It just meant that teams would spend and spend and spend and the only way that they'd have to keep up or be able to keep up, which they couldn't really, was to spend more money and it basically priced them out of Formula 1. So, And also the fact that teams spend more money, got higher than them, the constructors got more money and then didn't they couldn't survive. So cost cap is something which as well was thrashed out and made even more important by the events of COVID and the need of teams to save money uh, due to the fact that so much revenue and income was not going to come in in 2020 through things through lack of fans at races, lack of races itself, uh, needing to compensate for any COVID uh, restriction effects on the different teams. And Here's a quote from Ross Braun, who is the who was the managing director of Formula One before Stefano Domenicali. And the quote is from a press conference in 2019. He says, If you fraudulently breach the financial regulations, you will lose your championship. So, and the second part says, there'll be serious consequences for the teams that break these regulations. So, at the end of the day, the FIA has laid out their stall. And as far as I see it, they've got to have the guts to make a big decision. I'm not saying that someone should necessarily be stripped of their championship, but if it's in the rules that that is the decision that is taken when such a rule breach happens, they have to back it up. They can't say, oh, you know what? The FIA kind of messed up the finale last year at Abu Dhabi. It was a bit controversial, so let's not make it more controversial. You know, let's just keep it how it is. Let's let's not please or let's not uh, upset some people. It's th- this decision, whichever way it goes, is going to upset someone. So they might as well just make the decision anyway, you know, and just stick with their rules. It would be absolutely seismic at the same time if it, it overturned the championship result. And it would probably end up in court, I bet you. Um, but at the end of the day, if the FIA has had a statement put out there, which suggests that they're going to put down a severe punishment, they need to back it up. Simple as that. They can't back down and say, oh, you know what? We'll just give you a we'll give you a slap on the wrist, you know, just move on, just don't do it again, Red Bull, okay? Don't do it again, Aston Martin. Um they actually need to come down hard and deduct points, championships, something severe. Because if they want to really have this rule taken seriously, they need to enforce it. Um also because the uh, the cost cap, the budget the teams have, is gonna reduce the next two years as well. So Red Bull and Aston Martin, if they can't hold themselves to the higher limit then how are they going to hold themselves to the lower limits they've got to get the message out to them the FIA has to get the message out to them loud and clear that they have to get these correct and they have to adhere to these these budgets it's also interesting in amongst it that Williams um, in May 2022 filed a a breach of the cost cap but according to the FIA were able to quickly and imminently resolve it so clearly it's proving tricky for some of the teams but Williams managed to solve it. So it makes you think, why couldn't Red Bull and Aston Martin solve the same thing? Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. It's an interesting point you make, Tristan, actually, which I didn't know about how Red Bulls was audited by a company or a business a group which was specialising in financial auditing. So it, it may redu- makes you think there's a reduced chance that they would have made a mistake. But yeah, at the same time, let's see. It'll be interesting to to um to play out and just when you thought f1 could go anywhere without any political uh drama or any of that kind of thing you were wrong it's always there in the background and um it'd be interesting to see how how long this one lingers on but yeah as far as i'm concerned like if you're gonna say that you're gonna have punishments for breaches of these rules hand out the punishments when the time comes and when the rule is breached so i think the fia has a it's a big test of the FIA's credibility here, and you like to think that they will err on the side of, well, being credible, realistically. Yeah, I have to agree with both of you there. I think it's one of those where whatever sanctions are put in place on Red Bull, and I suppose Aston Martin as well for their procedural breach, but I understand that's a paperwork issue versus actual overspend. 
there should be a, a package, a range of sanctions, because the danger is if you just go and put one sanction down and say, right, we're fining Red Bull, then there's ways of uh, Christian Horner and the various elements of the team getting round it, or someone having to pay more of it, or ultimately the sanction not being as big as it uh, ultimately should have been. And you're totally right there, Angus. Another question for the FIA in terms of their credibility, in terms of their reputation, is if they didn't have enough on their plate in terms of redeeming that after Abu Dhabi still coming, you know, one year after that event they've got a lot of things on their plate really and um I think we'll see moving forwards in the coming weeks when the sanctions are revealed and months and I suppose the years as well when it comes to this uh, regime of the FIA whether they do have I suppose the decisiveness, the backbone and the, the cold heartedness to make a decision and to stick by it and to improve really because to go back to the points we've been saying so many times now if the FIA continue to get big decisions wrong their credibility goes down and ultimately people have less faith in them and that's bad for everyone. Yeah, it, it is bad. And it, bear in mind, it prevents as well others from coming into the sport because we need to have this fair and, 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 and you know decent playing field. And you don't have to go back very far when you see teams struggling to stay relevant and stay in the sport. Just think about Sauber and the roller coaster they've had to remain in the sport. When you go back to you know 2017, when Sauber were having to use the Ferrari engine from 2016 because... <laughs> They couldn't afford the newest one. And then, as you say, like companies like Lotus and Catrum having to fold out the sport because they can't because they can't afford to, to stay in it. You know, Lotus going bankrupt and Catrum, you know, they can't afford to stay in it. You know, it's a very, very expensive sport. And at the end of the day, money rules. You know, I, I'm, I was really sad to see that the W Series has just cancelled its final three races. And the reason is because they're not getting enough money to keep the series going. Which means, by the way, Jamie Chadwick wins her third season. Brilliant. Fantastic. Why isn't she, you know, entering properly into, you know, Formula 2 now, for goodness sake? For for uh, for something that calls itself a feeder series, I don't think the FIA are properly backing it. Um, And again, you know, this is the problem. F1 is all about money from teams trying to stay afloat to drivers trying to get into the sport i mean if we take jamie chadwick as an example her winnings will be about five hundred thousand dollars and the one of the reasons she says she hasn't managed to get further up into into the uh the formulas and towards formula one is because she still doesn't have enough money to do it could you imagine that imagine dominating three years your a, a particular feeder series <laughs> And then at the end of it, reflecting and being like, well, just don't have enough money, do I? And imagine also, you know, a team like Haas, who has had financial problems. Williams, again, has had financial problems. You know, for them, they're they're probably spending, you know, much less time and money competing in this sport. We have to give them an equal playing field and we want to attract better talent. Because you have to be the son of a billionaire or a multi-millionaire to get into the sport. And so, as a result, us fans, we're missing out on drivers, seats, opportunities. There is only 20 seats at the moment. We attracted two more two more teams. Then that would make four more seats. Which means we would increase it by, you know, a fifth. And I think that'd be brilliant. I think we really need to concentrate, which is why we're so harsh on you know Red Bull, for example, if they did overspend. Because as you say, Angus, they said they're going to come down hard and they've really got to stand by that because otherwise anyone can just overspend for, for, for whatever they want to do. And you know these big teams will basically be able to do it without consequence because they can pay the fine. And it seems that's all we've got time for in terms of episode 33 of F1 in Review. Thank you very much for listening all the way to the end of this episode, be that on your preferred podcast provider or via River Radio, be that live or via the Listen Back feature. A reminder that you can follow myself, Tristan, and the F1 in Review account on Twitter. Our handle for F1 in Review is just that, F1 in Review, no underscores, no dashes, no nothing. So moving forwards, we'll be addressing the final moves in the driver market. We'll be talking about Pierre Gasly going to Alpine, 
Nick De Vries going to Alpha Tauri. We'll also be speaking around the uh, seats of Haas and of Williams as well. The final seats there when it comes to Mick Schumacher and who's going to replace Latifi are yet to be decided. So here's hoping in the break between the Japanese Grand Prix and the Austin Grand Prix, we will see the driver lineup for 2023. And until next time, thank you very much for listening and we'll catch you next episode.